All right, so watch me the part two of Pine Creek Doug interviews Laura Robinson. And here's to you, Mrs. Robinson. Jesus loves you more than you would know. Whoa, whoa, whoa. God bless you, please, Mrs. Robinson. Heaven holds a place for those who pray. Hey, hey, hey. Hey, hey, hey. Dooka, dooka, doo. How did you know? I didn't write the song. Those are the actual lyrics of the Simon and Garfunkel song, I promise. Yeah, it's a Christian song. You didn't know that? Those are, those are the real lyrics. I didn't make that up. Those are the real lyrics. Is it intended as a Christian message? I don't know. Who's to say? But, okay, so he interviews Mrs. Robinson, and the first interview he had with her, um, I chatted with her a little in DM. She, taught me, she asked me what I thought of it. The first interview, I was actually really jealous. Um, yeah, a little bit. I chatted with her. She just asked me what I thought. She's a nice person. She's a nice person. Um, the first interview he had with her, I was really jealous. Why? Because he treated her like a normal human being. I was like, what on earth is this? Is this a new, is this a new and improved Pine Creek Doug? Pine Creek Doug duo? He asked her normal questions as if she were a normal human being. He said stuff like, you know, do, what do you think about heaven and hell? I like Leah, yeah, like he was talking to a normal person. With me, he was like, you know, why do you think I'm going to hell, Craig? <laughs> why, why, why have you sentenced me to hell in your religion, Craig? Something like that. Something really started off really awkward and never, never improved. Um, so at first I was jealous. But then I watched the second interview with Laura Robinson. And that was more along that. That's the Pine Creek Doug that I know and love. The Pine Creek Doug who has all the, the, the bizarre, you know, Totally, totally incoherent questions and thinks he's actually interviewing someone. That the, the second interview was more along the lines when he started asking her about her, her spiritual beliefs and her religious beliefs. Then he started acting more like the Pine Creek Doug I know. Um, so, uh, why the first? I, I'm pretty sure I understand why he was asking her normal questions like she was a normal for a person the first interview because she, he knew kind of what she was going to say and he wanted her to say it. She was going to challenge some of the deeply held sacred cows of some people in the Christian community. Now, if you're a Christian, listen to this. Keep in mind, I have no idea about any of this. I don't care about the historical this or that of any single part of the Bible. I'm not a historian. I'm not a Bible scholar. I'm not an academic along these lines. And I barely pay attention to even what the controversies are. So just, just, just a word to the wise. I have no idea what any of, this, what any of these controversies are. Was, you know... Is, was this book, I mean, I, I understand the basic outlines was, you know, these, these, these epistles were actually written by Paul, and these ones potentially, like Hebrews, may not have been, um, you know, I understand the basic outlines, but I have no real opinion on the matter. Uh, so, there's, no, there's nothing that she would say that I go, oh, I wish she wasn't saying that, just to put it in context. So I have no dog in the fight. When Doug is asking her questions, he wants her to say certain things. I get that. I can tell. I can tell. He can't wait for her to say, "Oh my God! I can't wait for you to challenge this sacred cow." I don't go. Oh, I wish she wasn't saying that. How could she possibly be saying that and call herself a Christian? I don't do that. Why? Because it's not relevant to me. I'm sure there is some historical. Um, there is some path to a historical understanding of what's true in the Bible and what's not, and that is between the academics and that's that's up to the historians to decide has no bearing on my spiritual life, has no bearing on my Christian walk at all. And this is the part that's going to get interesting to parse out with Doug's questioning of her. Why? Because he seems to think it's profoundly relevant. Partially because he's convinced himself it's profoundly relevant, partially because the atheist community at large, and to some degree the Christian community at large, has convinced themselves all that it's profoundly relevant. Well, let me clue you in all, it isn't. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> it's not one minute of it is. I promise you it's not. If you, if you are a Christian listening to me and you think that your Christian walk, you, there is something that they could discover in a Dead Sea Scroll somewhere that would challenge your faith, you need to make your faith stronger in the here and now today. And there's one way to do that. You pray more, you worship more, pray more, you worship more. If there's something that they, if you, if you see a headline, Dead Sea Scrolls uncover something, and you go, uh-oh, then you need to strengthen your Christian walk today in the here and now. Why? Because it's contingent on things that might not be so. <laughs> That's why. And it, and it makes you like, oh, what is she going to say here? If there's any single thing that could come out of a historian's mouth 
that would threaten your Christian walk at all, you need to strengthen your walk with the Lord. Bang. Just like that. Why? Because you're basing it on things that aren't relevant. Basing it on things that aren't relevant. That's why. So that, shouldn't be a, that shouldn't be a factor. You should be completely non-defensive when, when Laura Robertson goes up to talk. Some of what she's saying might be accurate. Some of it may be challenged along scholarship lines. I have no idea. He did the same thing when there's another scholar that he got all giddy over from uh, who I've actually listened to all of her lectures. Uh, the Yale woman from the, old, the one who does the Old Testament stuff in Yale. Excellent scholar. Excellent scholar. Uh, better than Bart Arman, by the way. Everyone who pimps out Bart Arman. Bart Arman's okay. It was like, he's the greatest. He's, he's not. He's just firmly committed to a type of agnosticism. There are inaccuracies in what he presents. You know, he actually does have a bias against the supernatural. But don't even get me started on that. So there's the, the I, I forget her name. There's the Christine something or other from Yale. He was, he was getting giddy over her, too. Oh, I can't believe when Christians hear this, they're going to throw up their hands in despair, and they're going to quit their religion. Okay, no, we're not. <laughs> oh, no, we're not. And I've listened to her and wasn't threatened at all. So, just so we're clear, he starts tr asking her questions like she's a normal human being. Why? Because she's saying things that he wants her to say in the first interview. He knows she's going to say something that's going to step on the toes of this particular Christian group or that particular Christian group. So he can't wait for her to say it. Oh, once, once, you know, once this person hears that, forget it. Then he starts asking her in the second interview about her religious beliefs. Now this is where it starts to get really interesting. Why? Because this is where his agenda comes to the surface. And he starts basically bending over backwards to prove her wrong, just like I say a lot of atheists do. He's particularly good at it. Now, not objecting to any of his line of questioning along. I mean, he was nice, he's cool, he's civilized, he was respectful. He wasn't doing anything like that. The first thing, and it would take me, probably take me a long time to fully unpack what it is he does, because it's really complicated. He's actually a pretty sharp guy. That's probably why I watch his videos. Um, he's got a really idi idiosyncratic take on counter-apologetics. Very different than a lot of other people, and probably the reason I watch it is because he's perceptive. Doesn't mean I think he's accurate, but he's perceptive. And he picks up on things that a lot of other people don't see. So, okay, let's, let's analyze his second... The second interview, he starts asking about her spiritual experiences or religious experiences, and then, the, then it starts feeling like a, Doug, a Pine Creek Doug interview. Then it's, I'm like, oh, okay, so he's going to do the same thing. He's going to run the same playbook on her that he does on everybody else. Good. So I stopped being jealous. Then I was like, okay, fine. But, so what does he do? The first thing he said somewhere in the beginning of the second interview is, um, everybody hates leading questions. I don't. You should, Doug. Bang, right there. <clears throat> Problem number one. Everybody hates leading questions. I don't. If you care about what's true, and this is not just for Doug, this is for anybody. If you care about what's true at all, leading questions are the enemy of truth. Did you hear me? Leading questions are the enemy of truth. They are not allowed in a court of law that should tell you everything you need to know. Why? Because they're not considered legitimate evidence gathering. Bang. Quite simply. Leading questions are the enemy of truth, no matter how much integrity you have. Doesn't matter if you think you're being honest. It doesn't matter if, you're, if you are asking leading questions. They are by definition misleading. By definition misleading. That is why they're not allowed in a court of law. Why? Because you lead somebody to what you think you already know. Bang! Just like that. hundred times out of a hundred. There's never any exception to it. Doug, if you care what's true at all, and you aren't just in the mission of trying to, you know, prove Christians wrong and jujitsu Christians, but if you actually care about fact-finding, and if you actually care about finding relevant information, relevant data, and learning something, you should, you should passionately detest leading questions with every fiber of your being. Why? They are the enemy of the truth. They are by definition misleading. They only lead you to what you think you already know. And they do it a hundred times out of a hundred. There's no exception. Why? Because you lead somebody to what you think you what you think you know. So she starts telling you about your religious her religious experiences. You ask leading questions. You're leading her to something that you want her to say, or that you already think you know. You already don't believe her religious experiences. I get that. That's perfectly obvious. It's your prerogative. If I say I have religious experience, you might believe, and I say they're really meaningful to me. 
They're powerfully important to my life. You might believe that. I say I go into my prayer closet of a powerful subject of internal experience. It's 100% real to me, and I, I honestly believe it's God. You probably believe every single thing I just said. But there's no way on earth you think it's God, which is your prerogative. But when you start asking leading questions, you start leading me to, I don't think it's God either. You don't think it's God either, Craig. Yes, I do. That's the point. Yes, I do. A hundred percent. I'm being a hundred percent honest. I passionately believe it's God with every fiber of my being. Not one minute of doubt inside of me. And if you start trying to ask me questions to show how I'm actually wobbly, you are doing something deeply misleading to both you, you and, and your audience. You don't agree with me. You don't think it's God. I get that. I'm not asking anybody to believe it's God. But I honestly believe it's God with every fiber of my being, 100, 100%, case closed. You put a gun to my head and said, is it God? You lie, you die. I say, yes. I'm pretty sure it's God. I would actually say I'm positive, if I'm being completely honest. Now, I get it. You don't believe me. That's your prerogative. I'm not asking that any, if you're an atheist listening to this, I'm not asking that any of you believe me ever. Don't care what you believe. That's between you and, you know, whatever, whatever quack, whatever thing you Whatever. That's between you and whatever. So, that's problem number one. You don't like, you, you have no problem with leading questions. You should detest them with every fiber of your being. Problem number two is that you think that you possess the truth already. And you are going to demonstrate to the, to the Christian convincingly how you already possess the truth. And sometimes you are successful, but that's because that person is wobbly. Hello? That's the only reason you're successful. That's why you're successful, because not every Christian is, really believes what they say they believe. That's the part where you're perceptive. A lot of Christians are defensive about their deeply held beliefs. Why? Because they don't honestly believe them when push comes to shove. Hello? Reality check. Yeah, that's true. And Doug has caught on to that. So he thinks every Christian is deep down inside as wobbly and unconvinced as some of the ones that... And he perceives it about... He's probably right about even some of your well-known apologists are a lot more wobbly. He's perceiving them to be a lot more wobbly in their beliefs than they, they think they are. He may be right. He may be right, but that doesn't mean he's right with everybody. Whether he's right with Laura, I don't know. But, to be perfectly fair to Laura, I thought she handled him swimmingly. I thought she handled him about as well as it was possible to handle his line of questioning. One, because it's, it's a deeply misleading line of questioning. It's let me lead you to what I already think I know, and let me then demonstrate it to you. The fact that leading questions are not allowed in a court of law should tell you everything you need to know about them. They are not allowed in a court of law. Why? Because they're by definition misleading. They're not considered evidence gathering. You're trying to demonstrate something to somebody, not inquire. You're trying to demonstrate something to yourself and the other person. You're not trying to inquire at all. You aren't asking. You're telling and couching it in question terms. And that becomes obvious. I'm pretty sure she experienced it as that. And then there's, there's the big mistake that he makes constantly in terms of ontology versus belief. And this is, this is a common mistake in the atheist community. There is ontology and belief. And constantly atheists are conflating these two as if they're relevant to each other. They are not. They are not. There's the ontology of what actually is and there's what people believe about it. Those two need not correspond with each other at all. Ever. And the belief has no bearing on the ontology. To demonstrate this clearly and just change the context, but this demonstrates it clearly. And if it holds true in this context, it holds true a hundred times out of a hundred. There is the size and shape of the earth, correct? That's the ontology of what actually is. That's the actual size and shape of the earth. Is it ever now contingent or will it ever be contingent on what somebody believes about it? Never. Does a flat earther have any influence on the actual size and shape of the earth? No. No. You understand it clearly in that context. Same thing holds true in a religious context. There's the ontology of what God actually is or is not. And that's it. God either is or is not. And people can have a wide variety of opinions on that subject. Matter of fact, they do. But what they believe on the subject is irrelevant to the ontology of what actually is. God either is or is not. Period. What people believe about is irrelevant. It's irrelevant. It's one of his go-to counter-arguments. You believe this, Laura. What's stopping the Hindu? What, why? What, but you don't believe the Hindu. 
Now, she had a really good answer that I'm sure he didn't quite process fully, but she had a really good explanation for it. She did actually really well under his line of, line of inquiry. She really did. She held up really well. Um, she said, she compared the ontology of what actually is God believed to a barn. There's a barn somewhere in the, in the distance. There's a red barn. She sees it from 30 feet away, walking past it. A Hindu might be seeing it from the other side of the barn, three miles down the road. That, in some ways, that could account for all of their discrepancies. Maybe not all, but a huge chunk. So they could be experiencing the exact same thing from totally different perspectives, totally different cultures, totally different lenses. Now that's a perfectly legitimate answer, and that actually lays to rest a thousand of these, everybody believes X, and they can't all be right, but they can all be wrong, fallacious reasoning. It's fallacious reasoning. It really is. It's fallacious reasoning. So if there's an ontology of what she's actually believing, let's say she's not deluding herself at all, just for argument's sake, and that when she goes into a prayer closet and she has her religious experiences that are meaningful to her, by the way, I give her, I, from what I heard that she's actually a practicing Christian and fairly committed one, that she, her, her Christian belief is somewhat important to her. And I heard, interestingly enough, some sort of, some sort of idea of who Jesus actually is that I found, you know, right on point. So she tries to explain the ontology of the house. He says, what about this Hindu person who believes that? And she goes, it depends on what that Hindu person believes. Do they believe in a God of love, kindness and compassion that governs the universe, that you should be a compassionate human being? How am I to argue with that? In other words, there are ideals underneath it all. And some of those ideals might match. They might line up one to one. Now, I believe those ideals are a reflection deep. When you look deep enough, you see those ideals are what are buried in Christianity, clear as day. That's the message of Christianity. You're supposed to act in a way that is Christ-like. You're supposed to humble yourself and be a, a kind and compassionate and caring human being. That's your first responsibility. This is my command that you love one another. That's your first responsibility as a Christian. So she's saying if a Hindu has that, considers, has found Hinduism to inspire him to that type of like brotherly love or kindness or service to humanity, who am I to argue with it? Now that's a really good response. <laughs> that's a really good response. It's a kind of nod to perennialism. In other words, if there's a Buddhist somewhere and a Hindu somewhere and their religion is inspiring values that I agree with, that I think are actually universally held and, and right, correct, you should aspire to be humble, loving, and of service to humanity. That's what she would call Christ-like, I'm pretty sure. That's what I would call Christ-like, I'm pretty sure. A Hindu can have the exact same ideals and say, this according to Shiva. What, 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 what we're not arguing with is the ideals. Now, some of them don't. Some would say Shiva says, you know, go, go slash and throw. If you talk to the, 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 Hindu, the Muslims, some of them have a really different idea of what, what, of what Allah is commanding. I guarantee. And it isn't, you know, love your neighbor as yourself. It's, if you don't believe me, behead him. But if the underlying ideals are the same, who is she to say? Now, yeah, it's a little, it's a little hippie. It's a little too hippie for me, Craig. It's a little too new age. You know, she, I, I get it. It's, it's not, it's not like, she's not Mrs. On Fire Fundamentalist, you know, going to come to your town and outlaw miniskirts. Yeah, she, you know, she should be, she should be more hardcore. <laughs> she should be, she should be more forming at the mouth <laughs> on fire for Jesus. But, you know, she should have told you, you're burning hell if you don't believe me, Doug. <laughs> it would have been, yeah, I would have found it more appropriate. No, you understand what I'm saying. There's a process where a reasonable person strikes me as an eminently reasonable human being, also strikes me as that she is at least somewhat committed to her Christianity. The fact that she was what you would call a liberal Christian doesn't really bother me at all. It's not relevant. You know, as opposed to what? As opposed to Ken Ham? Okay, we don't necessarily agree with Ken Ham either. She's kind of batting around in the, in the area where I'm like, that makes sense to me, and I, I think she's, you know... I think she's really thinking about it, and I, and I agree with what she, a lot of what she has to say. But that's because I don't care about the scholarship. I understand some of you are like, wow, did you see what she said? <laughs> I, you know, I, I have no dog in that fight. 
I have no dog in that fight at all. So I, I, I can't, it is totally beyond my purview and it's not, it's not something that's relevant to me. But it also isn't relevant to the ontology of what actually is. That's the point. It's not relevant to Doug either. That's the point. So he went through another complicated jujitsu mechanic thing where he was saying to her, literally, there's a couple things, let me see if I have time to go, because to unpack what went down would take a long time, but it'd kind of be well worth it, because the other jujitsu thing he did with her is he said something along the lines of, you know, Jesus said, the, uh, the comforter will I give to you, and he didn't actually say that. Doesn't that, really, doesn't that really trouble you and challenge your faith? He might not have actually said that. You don't think he actually said it. But that's not really the relevance. It's not really the, what's at issue. Again, there's the ontology of what actually is. And the Bible, the, the, the correspondence of the Bible to the reality of my religious experiences isn't based on, did somebody actually historically say that? Did Jesus really say that or did, was it his sidekick who said it? That's not what's relevant. What's relevant is he said, the comforter will I give to you. Now, when I back here on planet Earth, when I disappear in my prayer closet, Am I experiencing something akin to the comforter being given to me? Yes. Yes. It's not relevant whether he actually said those literal words or somebody else said it. What's relevant is that's in the Bible and it's a roadmap to a type of religious experience. And it corresponds to the religious experience that I'm actually having. The comforter. And there's hundreds of scriptures whether you're Bible literalist or not, that literally correspond to the ontology of what I'm actually experiencing. That's why I think it's so true. It isn't because, you know, I'm 100% convinced that the Book of Mark was written by whoever the conservative Christian. I don't even know who says, who says what about it. Don't care. It's there are certain things that, that's, that are said by Jesus. There are certain things that are said in the Bible. There are certain things that are said in the Psalms that correspond almost no for no perfect to what I'm experiencing and how I'm experiencing God to be. The ontology matches up with my actual lived experience. Note for note. So, for example, I disappear in my prayer closet. And when am I supposed to stop? When I feel the peace of God which passeth all understanding. That's from the Bible, the words of the Bible. In all things, through prayer and supplication, make your requests known. And then let the peace of God rule on your heart. Now that's an actual ontological statement of what I literally experience in the here and now, the peace of God which rules on my heart. Irrelevant who said it. Irrelevant it was if it was actually the words of a human being's mouth or, in, or uh, uh, you know, somebody wrote it in after the fact. Why? The only thing relevant is whether it's something I actually experience. The here and now. That's what she was kind of trying to tell Doug, that there was a living, breathing here and now aspect to Jesus. Some, uh, uh, you know, a presence you are trying to contact here and now. Then he does another, I mean, the, the jujitsu that he lays down. First of all, he told her that, this is what she basically said to him. All things being equal. This is what I heard, okay? Uh, I get a lot of meaning out of my religious experiences. They bring a lot of value to my life. I'm a sane and reasonable human being. I don't I try to be really fastidious when it comes to, to not be biased when it comes to the Bible. I try to parse it out accurately, historical accuracy. I do my best. And I try not to be, you know, have any confirmation bias like, I believe in Christianity, therefore this, I want to, you know. So she tries to rule out her confirmation biases when she's dealing with the historical t accuracy of the Bible. And then she goes on to say, and I'm not a hateful person, you know, I try really hard to be respectful to homosexuals, I tried, I tried hard to, to, to value science. So all things being equal, I get a lot of meaning out of my religious beliefs, and they, they bring a lot to my life, and I find the example of Jesus Christ personally inspiring. I think that that's a way to be a better human being, be more compassionate, be more kind, be more caring and loving. And you know what his answer to her? You should search hard and far and wide for a defeater. That's great, Laura, but you should keep looking for a defeater. Why? Why? That's exactly what he said to her promise. That's great. I get that. He, he kind of does get it, but it's not good enough. You have to search far and wide for a defeater. Now, there's something at play there, but it's not ontology. It's ideology. It's not. 
It's not, I just, I'm just not convinced, Craig. It's not, that's not really what's going on. Because he literally told her she should search far and wide for a defeater. That her, all things being equal, that's not good enough. She should keep looking until she finds ways to rule it out of the realm of possibility. That's not, I don't even know what that is, but that's not honest inquiry. Look, it's entirely possible that some religious experiences, some religious beliefs are predicated on faith. To that there's not going to be a, a, a one plus one in the here and now that you're going to be able to latch on to. So there may be things beyond which where you're going to have to say, well, I'm just going to have to receive that by faith. Now, atheists have worked really hard to make that a dirty word. It's not. There's a lot of things in life that you receive by faith that you have no avenue to other than believing. Hello? What are you doing tomorrow? Is things going to go well for you tomorrow? You kind of sort of believe that they wake up hoping they will. You got any evidence for that? No, of course not. Why? Tomorrow hasn't happened yet. That's what life actually is ultimately all about. And I'm not saying suspend your disbelief in some sort of ignorant, like, you know, imbecile way. Now I believe that the earth is 6,000 year old despite the evidence to the contrary. To disregard evidence to the contrary. It's not what he was saying to her. He was saying, here's some evidence that this is a good thing in your life. It's making you, helping to make you sane, reasonable, compassionate. Giving you strength in hard times, giving you peace of mind. There's some evidence of that. And he said, that's not good enough. You should search far and wide for a defeater. Why? Why? Because it was poison when I was growing up, Craig. I get that. That doesn't mean it's poison as it's practiced by everybody else. That's the only answer I can think of. I don't know why. I don't know why he thinks that you should do that. Why he thinks that's a good idea. That you should search far and wide for a defeater. That's the only good answer I can come up with. Because it was poisonous when I was growing up. It was poison to me growing up. Good. That was a form of it that's toxic. I get that. But that doesn't mean it's poison as it's practiced by everybody else. There's tons of fair and reasonable and fair-minded Christians with, you know, and that's why I don't think necessarily liberal Christian is the enemy of, you know, I, I get it that she should be more of a, like, like a Craig Reed style fundamentalist. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a fundamentalist, a Craig Reed style fundamentalist. You are? Yeah. Yeah. Wear a miniskirt in front of me. I'll send you to hell just like that. Bang. Just like that. You'll be burning in eternity faster than they make your head spin. Burning in eternity? Yeah, that's right. Anyways, so that's all. I'm going to wrap it up. Yeah, I had to, had to throw it in there. So, I don't know. There's, I'm going to go, I'll go over in the future. There's a lot of food for thought there, kids. And, you know, I didn't say this video all that perfectly. Take some of it with a grain of salt. Remember, these videos are just my notes. I'm just conversating, improvisating. This is, this is me just throwing it out there. I'm not preparing this ahead of time, okay? Just talking. So... Just conversating, improvising. There you have it, kids. That is all for now. Mass is ended. I say that Laura Robinson is a good thing. And remember what I've said time and time again. Some of this is politics. 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 It is in our best interest to, you know, be politically savvy when it comes to people like Laura Robinson who are kind of in between people. In between people like the Hammurabis, Laura Robinson, the kind of sort of Christians, kind of sort of agnostics. You know, Doug obviously has an agenda. He wants to turn them into totally and completely sold out to agnosticism, atheism. That's what he meant when he said the Bart Armin of, Christi of Christ the new Bart Armin. That's what he meant. She probably thought he meant the great scholar. It's not what he meant. He meant the totally sold out to agnosticism on the side of the atheists. Scholar. Committed to an ideology, if you ask me. Not necessarily to the historical veracity of the, of the Bible, but an ideology. But that's another video for another day. So there you have it, kids. Some of this is politics. Remember, you heard it from me first. A lot. <laughs> a lot. Yeah, you said a lot, Greg. Yeah, I can say it a lot. All right, there you have it. Masters ended. Go in peace. Amen.